Thank you. My name is Butch Maslin. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everybody. I, uh, this has been an absolutely wonderful weekend right up till about now. <laughs> Taking a downward turn. I, uh, my sobriety date is September the 21st, 1989. And I want to thank you people for that. Um, I want to thank Al for the invitation of being here this weekend and taking part uh, in your convention. I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here. And I'm not saying that because I'm at an AA meeting and it sounds nice. I'm not saying it because I want you to like me. I'm saying it because I mean it from the very bottom of my heart. You see, I consider it a privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I consider it a privilege just to come here and be with you people. And I want to thank you for the opportunity of coming here and taking part of this. I have a deep love for the United States of America. I really, really, truly do. And I'm really honored when you allow me to come here and take part in one of your conventions. And I want to thank you for sharing with my country this program that you guys, you guys started. And we really appreciate it, for sure. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers we have heard. This has really and truly been a magnificent weekend. It really has from, from the beginning right through and stuff and Stu and, and Linda and Vicky and, and Peg and, and, and Tim and, and, uh, and Frank. It's just, it's just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, I, I have the good opportunity to go to a lot of conferences and roundups and stuff like that. And I really uh, want to say to you that I've never identified so, and been touched by every single speaker that I've heard as I have this weekend. It's, it's really been wonderful. And, and I want to thank you for that. I, uh, I'm kind of wondering when Frank's going to come out of his shell, though, and says what he really means. <clears throat> I don't know if Frank's here this morning, but I'd, I'd heard of him. I had never heard him. And I want to tell you, that was just a spectacular AA message <laughs> last night. I, was, I, ta I called my sponsor last night, and I was saying, you've got you to gotta hear this guy. And I'm laughing now. Because I tell you, I, 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 I'm sitting thinking about that grocery store, and is that four items or is that four apples? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'll tell you why I'm laughing, because I identify with that 100%. I, uh, I have no regrets. I'm one of those fortunate alcoholics. I really identified with Vicky yesterday. I'm not a hairdresser, but I sure identify with you. <laughs> About her love for Alcoholics Anonymous and how from the day she came here. And, and that's been my experience. I have not had to have a drink the first time I ever came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was September the 21st, 1989. I haven't had to drink since then, and I fell in love with that program from that day up until this. And um, so I, I'm not, I, I know that's not everyone's experience. That's, that's just not the way for everybody, but that was my way. And, and, and I've loved everything about AA almost from the day I came. I love conferences. I love that whole stuff. And so I've had never had any regrets since coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, it, well, I've maybe had one, and that is that I didn't get to drink with some of you people. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Haven't you ever thought that? Huh? <laughs> Weren't you thinking last night when Frank was talking, I'd like to have done a little drinking with that fellow? I was I, I, I was I was talking at a conference a number of years ago up in Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. It's up in northern Ontario. It's on the Canadian-American border. I think it's Sioux, Michigan, on, on the other side of the border. And, and I was talking. I get up in the Saturday morning, and I, and I went down to the restaurant to have something to eat, and I picked up the local paper. I wanted to read a little bit about the community I was in, as I did, did here this weekend. I feel that's only right. And, and there was a story on the front page of this paper, and it was a, a fellow they had arrested him coming across the American-Canadian border, drunk on a stolen street sweeper. <clears throat> and I immediately thought to myself, I'd like to have done a little drinking with that guy. I, had, I knew at that moment that he, we've heard, I heard it a couple times this weekend, he had one of those keen alcoholic minds that we hear about in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
I don't know if you. I've heard people this week, and I was at a at, at a, a, a meeting at my home a little while ago. There was a guy there, good AA guy. I know him well, and he's up talking, and he's saying that he's dead serious about this, and he's saying things like, "When alcoholics sober up, they're brighter than the average person." If there's anybody here new, and I sure hope there is, I just want to point out to you when you hear about the keen alcoholic mind, it is always from an alcoholic. <laughs> You will not hear about the keen alcoholic mind at the Al-Anon meeting. Let me tell you that for sure. <clears throat> I, uh, this really, truly, uh, it, this has been a beautiful deal. This has been a, just a beautiful deal, and, and really it is, it, it's all been said. It, it really has all been said, and... And I want to thank, I, I don't know, I, I know in the United States you're probably not this selfish, but in Canada we're very selfish. And uh, it's very easy for me to come to these conferences and conventions and come here and enjoy all the speakers and have uh, some beautiful banquet or meal if they have and, and this fellowship and all this, just a wonderful weekend. And get in my car on a Sunday morning and drive home and forget all the work that's been done on our behalf. You see, these things don't just happen. And there has been people, I'm sure, over the past year who've taken time out of their lives to make this weekend work for us. There has been people that have sat out there at, at the registration desk and that and given up their entire weekend. There is people that have been at work long before you and I got here, and there are people who will be tearing this down and cleaning this thing up and working on our behalf long after we've gone home. And at some times it's very easy for me to take that for granted. And I want to thank you, Al, and your whole committee for all the work they've done on our behalf. Really. Uh, as I said, I'm happy, I'm happy to be here because alcoholics don't always get where they're going. We just sometimes don't get where we're going. Particularly drinking alcoholics. They seldom get where they're going. But sometimes even sober alcoholics say we don't get where we're going, do we? I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. I was going to, well, first of all, I should tell you there was a time in my life that I was not allowed in the United States of America. And let me add, nor should I have been. They said, we have enough people like you already. We don't need to import them. So I was not allowed in the United States, but in, in, in sobriety and that, I have applied to the U.S. Department of Justice for a waiver. And, and I'm, a, I'm allowed in the United States of America. I have it upstairs right now. It's in my, in my suitcase. It's a beautiful piece of paper. It is a beautiful piece of paper. It says United States Department of Justice. And I'm allowed in the United States of America on humanitarian grounds. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. And when I come here, every time I come here, I have to show that to come in the country. Tim and I were talking. He used to get little problems up in Canada, but <laughs> as he should have. We've got enough people like him already, too. Anyway, I, when I come, I've got to show this and stuff. Now, <clears throat> when, when, I, when I got this thing, uh, I'm one of those alcoholics with the keen mind, too. And I don't know about you, but I, from time to time, misplace things. <laughs> so I made 25 photocopies. <laughs> and I'm going to talk at, at a conference in Illinois a few years ago, and, uh, and, and I get up in the morning, and I'm getting ready. I always like to fly early Friday morning so I, can, so I can get here early. And I'm looking around for my waiver I can't find. I said to my wife, I said, Deb, where's my waiver? Like it's her job to know where my waiver is. She said, Butch, I don't know. It's wherever you've put it. I said, no, 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 no. You've put it somewhere. It's missing. <laughs> she said, look, just take one of the photocopies. I'll find it where I wait. Get going. You're going to miss your flight. So I got one of my photocopies. Off I go. And, and now I'm at the, uh, at, the, at the immigration. And please don't misunderstand me. Our border people do a wonderful job protecting our borders. God bless them. But I think when those guys go to custom agent school, they teach them how not to smile. Huh? They're a stern looking bunch. And I got there and stuff. And when I come to the United States of America, when they say, where are you going? Uh, saying Holiday Inn is not enough. <laughs> they want to know the address of where I'm going. So anyway, 
I get there and I go up to this uh, to the guy and I give him my stuff and I give him my passport and I give him my waiver. He looks at this. He says, what's this? I said, it's, it's a U.S. waiver. He says, what are you, a criminal? I said, well, perhaps you could have said that at one time. He said to me, this is a photocopy. I said to him, I know I keep the original at home for safekeeping. Lies just fall out of my mouth. They just... I don't have to think of them. They just come. <clears throat> he says to me, you, you can't travel on a photocopy. He said, where's your I-94 form? So I pull out the form. He says, that's the wrong form. I thought, I don't like the way this is shaping up. <laughs> he says, go over there, fill out the right form. You're going to have to talk to somebody about this photocopy because you can't travel on a photocopy. So I go over, I fill out the form I've got to fill out, but I'm watching. And I wait till his line gets filled up and I go over to the other line. Huh? There's an older, softer looking gentleman there. And I go up to him and, and I give him my stuff and he said to me, uh, you know, uh, where are you going? What's your purpose of business? I said, I'm going to talk at a conference of Alcoholics Anonymous in Illinois. So he gets the papers of that and he says to me, he says, what's the address you're staying at? I would forgot to get the address. I said, uh, I don't know. He said, you don't know where you're staying? I said, no, but I said, somebody's going to pick me up at the airport and take me there. He says to me, who's picking you up at the airport? I said, I don't know. He said, let me get this straight. <laughs> Somebody you don't know is picking you up, taking you somewhere you don't know where you're going. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he said, what did you say you're going there for again? I said, well, I'm going to talk at a conference, Alcoholics Anonymous. He says to me, what are you going to talk about? Before I could answer him, he looked at me and said, hold it. You don't know. So I'm happy to be here. I, uh, we have some, we're not a glum lot, are we? Uh, we aren't a glum lot. No, no, we cry enough. I, uh, I was 25 years old, and uh, by, I, had, I had a new address every night. I was living in stairwells in downtown Toronto by now, and I just moved from building to building. And at nighttime, I'd be under that stairwell, and in the daytimes, I would be like a rat in a sewer, out on those streets scampering, trying to steal, trying to get. Huh? And I'm 25 years old, and my wife, she'd throw me out of our home, and I want to tell you something. I loved her. I loved her a lot. And she'd throw me out. I'm living in stairwells now. And I don't know if you t talk. I hear an AA at home. People talk about AA luggage, matching green garbage bags. Huh? <laughs> I didn't have any AA luggage. I had the clothes on my back. Still had an ultra suede jacket, though, Stu. Going to be cool at any expense. Huh? If I was any cooler, I'd froze to death. I'm 25 years old. I'm, in, I'm, I'm living in stairwells. I got the clothes on my back. I'm physically sober. And nobody wants anything more to do with me. And let me add, nor should they. Because you see, alcoholics of my type are users and takers. I use and I take from everybody I come in contact with. And I'll tell you, if you're an alcoholic of my type, who I use and take from most is the people who love me. Because they can't stop giving. And they think, maybe this time, maybe this time it's going to work. And I use those people till eventually I even break their hearts. And even the people who love me and care about me can't be around me anymore. And even those people push me away. And that's where I was. Nobody in this world wanted anything more to do with me. And I'm 25 years old living in stairwells. I'm out in the east end of Toronto one night. I'm all jacked up and I don't have anywhere to live. And I got nowhere to go. And, and my wife and I had owned a home in, in, in Toronto, one they call the beaches, down, on the, down by the lake. And, and we had a screened-in porch with a couple of wicker couches on it. And I thought, I'm going to slip into that porch and grab a couple hours and get out before she wakes up in the morning. 
Well, I pass out. And I wake up to one of these. And I opened my eyes and looked, and there was that little gal that I loved. And she looked at me with disgust and pity. And she said, Butch, you are a useless piece of scum, and you are never going to change. And if you care anything about me whatsoever, you will get up and get out of here, and please don't ever come back, because I can't stand to look at you the way you are. And I got up and I left there and I went down and went to call the boardwalk in Toronto, down on the waterfront. And it was July or August, I don't know, but it was hot. It was a hot, hot summer day. And I'm sick and I'm hungover and I'm heart sick and I'm dirty. And I walked down there and I'm sitting on a park bench. And I looked over where you guys are sitting and there was a park bench and there was a little boy, five or six years old, sitting on that bench eating a popsicle. And I looked over at that little boy and you know what I thought to myself? I wish I had a nickel. For a popsicle. Huh? The big shot. The big shot in the bar buying everybody drinks. The big drug dealer. Huh? The big shot. 25 years old, sitting on a park bench, wishing he had a nickel for a popsicle. And here's the thought that I had at that moment. I knew that's as good as my life was ever going to get. Huh? Now, I've always been a talker. I've always been a scammer. I knew I'd hustle something up. I'd rip someone off. I'd come up with some cash somewhere. But I knew at that moment that park bench is where I was going to end back up every single time. And I was 25 years old. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 33. I had eight more years on those streets, and I will not bore you with the details. But you and I know it never gets better. It always gets worse. And I had eight more years there. Huh? And I came to you people, and I did some of the things that we've heard this weekend. I joined a group, and I got a sponsor, and I took these actions. You know where I was a couple months ago? Huh? I was in Rome, Italy, standing in the Sistine Chapel, looking at the paintings of Michelangelo from 500 years before with my wife beside me, and the tears started to pour down my face. And I thought of that 25-year-old kid sitting on a park bench, wishing he had a nickel for a popsicle. Huh? How do you get from a park bench to the Sistine Chapel? How do you get, Stu, from where you were to holding your father's head in your hand? How did we get to where we were? We've heard this story after story after story. How did Frank get from where he was to walking his daughter down that aisle? Every single story, this transformation that we have heard this weekend. How do we get from the dredges of society where nobody, our own families, are embarrassed or too hurt to ever be around us with absolutely no hope? How do we get from there to where you and I sit this morning? How does that happen? Because it's not supposed to, is it? But you and I know how it happens. And there's only one way, and that is through the grace of God that you and I have been introduced to through the 12 Steps Alcoholics Anonymous. We are so richly blessed. Am I happy to be here? Oh, you want to believe it. I like to drink. (laughs) I don't know about you guys, but I like drinking it. Peg said it so well the other night. I think people in Alcoholics Anonymous think it's sacrilegious to say like drinking for God's sakes. Huh? I hear people in these meetings. Drinking took me places I didn't want to go. (laughs) Doing things I didn't want to do. With people I didn't want to be with. I'm thinking to myself, why'd you bother? (laughs) Huh? I wanted to be with those people in those places doing those things. I love that stuff. I love that action. And the seedier, the better. I I loved it. I, I, I started to drink it. I heard people in Alcoholics Anonymous talk about dysfunctional families. Was my family dysfunctional? I don't know. Let me just tell you, it wasn't the Cleaver residents around my home. There was lots of parties in my home. There was lots of drinking in my home. And as a little boy, they'd let me play bartender. And I could take them beers and take away the empties. And they'd let me have swigs. And they'd say, isn't he cute? Huh? Oh. And I love that attention. Uh, I love that attention. So I started to drink when I was four years old. Now, I wasn't a daily drinker when I was four. My allowance wouldn't allow it. I actively sought out alcohol. I don't know. I was 12 or 13 years old. I got a guy to go into a liquor store, get us a couple bottles of wine. Going to be a wine connoisseur. A couple bottles of four aces. I think it's comparable. You call Thunderbird here. Huh? (laughs) 
And I'll tell you, any wine I ever drank had a cap, not a cork. We drank that wine, puked, passed out, and that was the end of my social drinking. It was all downhill after that. Huh? I hear people in Alcoholics Anonymous say things like they came to Alcoholics Anonymous hoping to learn how to be a social drinker. You ever hear that? Huh? Came to Alcoholics Anonymous hoping AA was going to teach them how to drink socially. I want to tell you this morning, I didn't want to be a social drinker when I drank. I don't want to be a social drinker today. I don't particularly like social drinkers. Huh? Weird people. Weird people. You ever watch a social drinker drink? Huh? They let the ice melt in their glass. That's sick drinking, isn't it, Tim? That's, that's alcohol abuse. You ever drink with a social drinker? Huh? That's enough to make you puke, isn't it? You're having a few scoots? Would you like another one? Oh, no, thank you. I'm starting to feel it. Really? I thought that's when you put it in overdrive. Don't identify with social drinkers. Don't identify with closet alcoholics. You know the people you'd hear, they get the bottle, go in, lock the door, put on the country western music. Doesn't mean they're not alcoholic, just drank differently than me. I'm a barroom drinker. Huh? I love those bar rooms. I just I like opening the door to a bar. Huh? That smoke would billow out, that tinkle of glass. I like neon. I like neon. I liked it when I was drinking, I still like it. That's why I stare to those casinos. They're not good places for guys like me. And I thank God I never tried to get sober in the United States of America. I don't think I'd ever made it. I love being sober here, but I want to tell you, I love drinking here. I love those places you got them. I call them juke joints. You know those divey little corner bars you see? Those divey little joints with the little neon sign that says cocktails. Oh, huh? I was on my way to an AA thing in Pennsylvania one time. Deb and I were driving there. And I'm driving my car. I'm driving through this little town in the middle of nowhere. And I'm driving down the main street. And I hammer on the brakes to the car. I'm backing the car up. She said, Butch, what are you doing? I said, i got to see this again. <laughs> and there it was, this divey little joint. This divey little dump with a neon sign said, Stop for one, stay till one. <laughs> oh. If I'd have been drinking, I'd have had that tattooed on me. Huh? Absolute piece of art. I love that stuff. I love those joints. I loved everything about it and stuff. I was a type of alcoholic. I know none of you guys are like this, but I like to be a big shot. Huh? I'd be the guy in the bar buying the drinks for everybody, passing the bag around, the party's on. I'm the type of alcoholic I could never stand for the party to end. I hated for the party to end. I'd be in that bar drinking 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Hotels in, in Canada close at 1 o'clock. Then maybe change now, but 12 o'clock, I'd say, listen, you're all invited back to my house. I got a case of vodka. I got a bag. Come on, the party's on. We'd be back there drinking, snorting, carrying on. It's 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock. Everybody's starting to go. I'd say, Linda, where are you going? It's only five o'clock. You don't have to work till seven. So, sit down and relax. Come on. And now it's just Al and I left. Everybody's gone. Al's, and Al's gonna wants to go. I'd say, Al, sit down, buddy. Relax. Just come on. I'll make you. I'm, I'm making them sit down. One more drink, Al, buddy. You have to work tomorrow. Don't worry about it. I'll call your boss. <laughs> huh? Your wife's gonna be upset. Take mine. Just don't go. Huh? Couldn't stand the party to end. You know why? You know why? I hated to be alone. Oh, God, I hated to be alone. See, as long as the party was going, the music was blaring, I could be buying you drinks, you're telling me what a wonderful guy I am. Huh? You see, I needed your attention. I needed your approval more than I ever needed a double vodka. The vodka allowed me to act in a way where I felt I could get your approval. Huh? And that's what I really needed. I'm not going to talk any more about my drinking this morning other than to very quickly share with you what drinking does to and for an alcoholic of my type. I don't know what drinking does for you, but I want to share with you what it does for me. I've come to believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. It doesn't matter if I'm drinking Dom Perignon or aftershave lotion. It doesn't matter if I'm drinking in the Fairmont Hotel or under a bridge in a box. It's what drinking does to me that's important. And I want to very quickly share with you what it does for me. I, I'm, a, I, I'm the type of alcoholic. We talk, um, uh, when I look back in my life, the things that I share with you, I was not thinking them at the time. 
I see it today as you took me back through an inventory, as I look back through my life. But I can remember now being a little boy in school. I don't know how old, eight years old, nine years old, I'd be in that classroom. And the teacher, she'd ask a question in class, and she'd start looking around to see who she's going to ask to answer the question. And my head goes down like this. Oh, don't let her ask me. Because I know if she makes eye contact with me, she's asking me to answer the question, and I don't want to answer the question. It don't even matter if I know the answer to the question. I don't want to answer the question. And when I went to school, we used to have to do book report. Get up in front of a whole classroom full of kids. Ho, ho, no good. No good. I get up in the morning, I'd say, Ma, I've been puking all night, Ma. I can't go to school today. I'm too sick to go. Please don't make me go today, Ma. Because I want to tell you that I would be absolutely terrified at the thought of getting up in front of that classroom full of kids. Terrified. Huh? Every now and then I'd get in one of these little jags where I quit drinking, some sort of crazy thinking. And I'd, I'd, I'd have to go to a wedding. Ever go to a wedding sober? That is a bad deal. That is a bad deal for me. I'd be at that church and I'm telling you, I'm starting to sweat already thinking about that reception three hours from now. And I'm now at that reception. That dance is going to start. I haven't had a drink in me and I want to tell you, my hands are sweaty. I've got a knot in the pit of my stomach and I feel awkward and out of place. And I've got to do one of two things. I've got to get over to that bar and get a couple in me or I've got to get out of there because I can't stand the way that I'm feeling. Huh? Every decision I ever made in my life was based on fear and ungrounded and unfounded. Where I went, what I did. you want to go over with these? No, I'm not going with those goofs. I'll tell you what the truth is. I was uncomfortable with those people. I felt awkward and out of place. And the killer for alcoholic is, is I never even knew I was afraid. Didn't even know it. We talk an awful lot in Alcoholics Anonymous about resentments, don't we? I don't know if you do here in the States. But in Canada. Let's discuss resentments. <laughs> huh? I prefer to call it hate. Absolute hate. I know you're not that sick, but I'll tell you, in Canada, I'm the type of alcoholic. I'd be out driving in my car. I'm at a red light. I'm on the nod by now. And that light turns green, and the guy behind me lays on his horn. Oh, jeez. Huh? I almost go through the roof of my car. I want to get out of my car, go back there, open the door, drag him out by the throat, take a crowbar, and crack his skull wide open. I know you spiritual giants never thought thoughts like that. <laughs> But I do hate. I see some guy sitting in a bar room across the room. I want to go over and crack him one. I don't even know him. I hate people I haven't even met. Huh? I'm talking hate. I'm not talking anger management here. <laughs> I'm talking a rage. I'm talking a white rage that I don't have five seconds before and I don't have five seconds after. But I've got a rage in me that wells up from time to time that I have absolutely no control over. And I do things and say things to people that I never wanted to do. Huh? And I'll tell you who takes the brunt of my rage if you're an alcoholic like me is the people who love me. You see, it happens behind closed doors. Because I'm a people pleaser. I want everybody to like me. I want to be everybody's friend. I'm in the bar buying drinks for everybody, the big shot. So you keep that rage for the people who already love you and care about you. Because I already have their approval. I don't need theirs. Lonely. I'm 25 years old. I'm standing at a subway platform in downtown Toronto. And a train pulled up and the doors opened. And a young couple my age got off that train holding hands. And they walked off into the night laughing and smiling. And I felt an emptiness and a loneliness like I couldn't describe. And you know what I thought to myself? Why can't I be like those people? Why can't I just be like other people? I remember walking through in a nice warm summer's night, just getting dark through a nice residential area of town. And, and, and it would be just getting dark. And, and the homes, you'd see the lights would be on. And the television, you'd see the families in there. And I'd look at that and think, why can't I be like those people? Why can't I just have a home and a family like other people? Why is all the trouble got to keep happening? All this stuff got to keep happening. From as long as I can ever remember, I was restless, irritable, and discontented. If I was drinking at this bar, I'd say, guys, drink up, let's go over to the other bar. If I was at this party, I'd say, drink up, let's go to the next party. If I had this job, I should have that job. Never quite right. And I'll tell you, I get one of those double vodkas. I don't know what it was like for you. I get one of those vodkas just like this. I don't know if you remember that feel or not, but just like this. <laughs> I do that. I did, I did that in a meeting one night. Two guys got up and left. <laughs> huh? They remember the feeling. 
I have a few of those double vodkas, and I'm going to tell you something. That rage subsides, that loneliness vanishes, those sweaty hands are gone, and I walk into that wedding now like I own the joint. Huh? And I am moving and grooving. And I'm talking to the ladies, and I'm sitting around with my buddies, and we're drinking and carrying on. And at that moment, everything in my life is absolutely perfect. And that's why I drink alcohol. You put alcohol in my system and I get a sense of ease and comfort. And the world is a much better looking place. And my perception of reality now changes. And that's what makes me alcoholic. But I'd start drinking. I'd end up, I'd drink 60 ounces of vodka and I'd go out and I'd smash my car up. Huh? I'd tell the guys, I'd go out for a few beers with the boys after work. I'd go on a three-day bender. I'd get fired from my job. I tell my wife I'm going out for a, for a loaf of bread. I run into stew. We go on a three-week bender. Now my wife's leaving me. I'm out there drinking. I'm carrying on. I got no money, so now I'm stealing yours, and I'm going to jail. And what everybody focused on in my life was the crashed cars, the broken marriages, lost jobs, going to jail. We looked at drinking. We never looked at alcoholism. And people told me from the time I was 18 years old, Butch, if you just quit drinking and sticking needles in your arms, kid, you'd be okay. And there was times I wasn't drinking, and guess what? I wasn't okay. I'm crazier sober than I was when I drank. But that's what we focused on, because all they could see was me drinking the trouble that followed. So naturally, they said, stop drinking, it'll be okay. But they had absolutely no idea how I feel when I'm sober. How could they know? Because I didn't even know. But that's what we focused on. I'd love to stand up here this morning and tell you I woke up one morning. Finance company was dying to lend me money. <laughs> Work was thinking of promoting me. My wife was sending me flowers. And I thought, I think I'll join Alcoholics Anonymous today. huh? Every now and then I hear some moron from the front of one of these rooms say things like, if you're not here for the right reasons, you might as well drink. And every now and then I'd like to get the tire iron back out. huh? <laughs> The right reasons? Did you come to Alcoholics Anonymous for the right reasons? <laughs> My boss called me into work on a Tuesday. He said, Butch, you're a very good employee. I said, well, thank you. He said, but you're not here much. <clears throat> I felt he was being picky. He said, you think you might have a problem with alcohol? I said, no, but I know what the problem is. He said, what would that be? I said, it's my health. He said, really? I said, yes. Now, granted, my poor health may have something to do with my drinking. I'm going to quit drinking. My health's going to get better. Evan's going to be okay. He said, you think you might need some help quitting drinking? I said, no, I'm just going to quit. Get up, left his office, was to find out later his wife had been a member of Alcoholics Anonymous for a number of years. Can you imagine the chuckle he had as I left? Huh? Uh, he's just going to quit. <clears throat> that was Tuesday. I woke up Thursday in another hotel room in another town drunk. I didn't keep him waiting long. And for whatever the reason, I knew the jig was up this time. I knew I'm in trouble. I would used all the lies. I don't know what that's about. I'd said alcoholics are liars. Huh? I'd, I'd sooner lie when the truth would serve me better. I'm a pathological liar. I will go out. I am an alcoholic. Gospel truth goes out and plays golf all by himself and cheats on the scorecard. <laughs> That's not the best part. At the end of it, I take a look and go, good game, Butch. Good game. I believe my own lies. Huh? So I, used, I knew I'm in trouble. I, got, I had a few tequilas. I turned my mind to it, and I thought, I know what I'll tell them. I'm alcoholic, and I'm going to go to AA. And that's how I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And if there's anybody in this room this morning, and I sure hope there is, that is new to Alcoholics Anonymous, we couldn't care less why you're here. We couldn't care less. We're just glad to see you. And maybe, just maybe by the grace of God, something someone will say, something you'll read, something you'll hear, and the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous can happen in your life like it has so many of these men and women, and you'll be able to go on and live a happily and usefully whole life. Just keep coming. Because we're glad to see you. And I started coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want to tell you that I have been an absolutely blessed man since the day I came into AA. I have a deep, deep love in my heart for the old timers. A deep love. Men and women who've been coming for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Who've made sacrifices and commitments 
to this thing so it would be here for people like you and I. I love them from the bottom of my heart. And if you are new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I would urge you to get close to these men and women and learn from their experience because we're not going to have them with us forever. And I had some wonderful people come into my life, some giants, none more than my own sponsor, Bobby Dobson. Huh? I've heard people in Alcoholics Anonymous say you should not put people on pedestals. Well, you do what you want. But I'm going to tell you something. I have some people on pedestals. Giants. Giants. Never for a moment have I lost sight of the humanities. Do you want to know the greatest gifts that the old timers have ever given me? The greatest gift, people like Frank and Stu and Peg and, and, and other people that we've listened to and that. The greatest thing you've ever done for me. You've allowed me to see your humanities. You've allowed me to see your mistakes. Huh? You've allowed me to see your shortcomings. Because let me tell you, if you hadn't, I'd never measure up. I would never measure up. And I had some giants come into my life. Giants and giants. Men and women who took time out of their lives to help me. Uh, to help me to understand what was wrong with me. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue what the problem was. I'd been told what the problem was. I'd heard all my life what the problem was. My parents told me, police told me, doctors told me, psychiatrists. I'd heard from a lot of people, but you just quit drinking, you'll be okay. Huh? I had heard that and heard that. Never had a clue. I go to a detox at home on Mondays. I'll be there tomorrow, 2 o'clock, to talk to the people in there. It's not my job. It's just what I do. I'm a product of strong sponsorship, and I believe in strong sponsorship. And I go there, and I talk to those guys and gals in there, and I'll be there tomorrow afternoon seeing them. And I'll say to those people there, I say, anybody here ever lose a job because of their drinking? Sort of a goofy question to ask an alky, isn't it? Huh? Anybody here ever get in trouble with the law because of their drinking? Anybody here ever have their families split up? Because of their drinking. Anybody here ever hurt people that they love and care about because of their drinking? Anybody here ever hurt themselves? And I look at these people. I don't know if you have them here. We got these cars at home. They got a little doggy in the back window. The head bobs up and down. Uh, you ever see that? Well, I'm looking at a dozen heads bobbing up and down. And I say to those guys and gals, I want to ask you a question. Knowing that, knowing everything that drinking has done in your life time and time again, Knowing the trouble that is caused, knowing the people that you've hurt, knowing the devastation and destruction that it's doing in your life, knowing all that, can you tell me why you'd go back and do it again? And I look at the blankest looking faces you have ever seen. And I say to them, if you're an alcoholic of my type, your answer to that question is exactly the same answer that I had when my mom and dad sat in a prison visiting room when I was 17 years old with the tears coming down their face, saying, Butch, why? Why again? You promised there'd be no more. It is exactly the same answer that I had when my wife sat at a kitchen table and the tears coming down her face, saying, Butch, you promised me. You just promised me there'd be no more drinking. Why? And do you know what I said to those people? And it was the only truth coming out of my mouth in those days. I would look at those people and say, I don't know. I don't know. And that was the absolute truth because it isn't what I wanted to do. I had no idea what the problem was. You were the first people that told me. You said, Butch, drinking's not your problem. It's your solution. How you feel when you're sober is your problem. And that's why you go back and do that time and time again, even though it's killing you, because you can't stand the way you feel sober. And you have to do one of two things eventually. Blow your brains out or drink again. And most of us return to drinking. Huh? Didn't have a clue. You told me that lack of power was my dilemma. That I didn't have the power. I hear people all the time in that talk about, oh, so I can't understand why Billy went back drinking. Well, I can. He was powerless. huh? All the time we say that. Can't understand why people go back. Tells us right in the book. Frank said at the end of his talk last night. Rarely have we seen a person fail who's surly followed our path. Tells us right after that why people don't stay. Because they cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. huh? Lack of power is my dilemma. And you told me that is what this program is about. That is what these 12 steps are about. Allow me to find a power in my life to solve my problems. Huh? Didn't have a clue. Didn't have a clue. 
I, uh, I was in a meeting, uh, I was a few months sober. And at the meeting, at the, it was announced at the end there was going to be a retreat. And uh, there was a guy who went up to him after, his name was Harry Kemp. Harry Kemp, I think, was sober about 100 years or so by then. <laughs> I think he was God's first sponsor when God sobered up. I went to Harry. I said, Harry, what's the deal? What goes on there? He said, what? She said, don't you worry about it. You just go. He said, it's going to be all AA people there. There'll be meetings and stuff there. He said, it'll be good for you. And I went to walk away. He said to me, come back here for a sec. He said, listen, kid. He said, I'm not, he says, I'm not saying this is going to happen to you. But he said, I have seen people go to these things and come back a different person. I said, oh, that's nice, Harry. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Anyway, I went to this deal and stuff, and I went in there on the Friday night, and there's a bunch of people sitting around in a room smoking, drinking coffee, and lying like Alkies do. And there was a man sitting there that I'd heard talk at a roundup, an older fellow, sober a long, long time. And when I saw him, I felt good. I just, I, I just felt good seeing him. And anyway, I got in, and we're sitting in this room, sitting around drinking coffee. I was sitting beside this man. And people were talking and stuff. And he's one of those people, and I know many of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about. He's one of those people that you just felt good being next to. Huh? There was something about him. There was a gentleness about him. There was a kindness about him. There was a love about him. And I just felt good being beside him. And we yacked and stuff. It got late into the night, and he was going to bed. He got up. And when he got up, he put his head gently on the top of my head. He said, I'll see you in the morning, kid. And I felt goosebumps. And he left. Next morning, there was a a meeting. He was telling his story, as I'm telling here tonight, or this morning. And as he told his story, I could feel that feeling that I was feeling the night before. And I could feel my eyes welling up with tears as he talked. And at the end of his talk, that he said that he wanted to close his talk with a wish for us. And he said that that wish for us was that God's richest blessings, that God's richest blessings be heaped upon each and every one of us. And here's where the miracle happened for me. He said, because my dear friends, you're deserving of absolutely nothing less. And I started to cry. And that weekend ended and stuff, and I was driving home, and I got a couple guys in the car, and I'm driving down the road. My eyes are filling up with tears, and I'm trying not to cry because we all know tough guys don't cry. (laughs) And I'm driving down that road, and for the very first time in my life, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I knew two things. The first thing that I knew for the first time in my life is there was a God and that He was with me. And the other thing that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, I was going to be okay. I knew it that night. I know it this morning. And I came back and and, and things started to change in my life. I have been treated with nothing but kindness and respect and love since the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I am the beneficiary of your kindness and love. I've been treated like that from the first day I came here till today. But I want to tell you something. I am very grateful that the men and women who came into my life cared a lot more about me getting well than they did me liking them. Huh? Huh? And they told me the truth. They told me the truth. They told me Alcoholics Anonymous is about action. It's not about sitting around discussing, sitting around talking, sitting around. It's about doing, Butch. It is a program of action. It is a program of change. You're going to start to change here. It is not enough just not to drink. And those changes are going to be small. And they're going to grow. And you're going to start out. And they taught me some of the basic fundamentals. You see, they told me that selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problem. That's my problem. And from that selfishness and self-centeredness come a hundred forms of fear and resentment. Selfish and self-centered, the root of my problem. They told me I needed to change. They told me things like, Butch, we want you to come to that meeting early. We want you to go to the washroom, get your coffee, sit down and be quiet. Maybe you don't want to listen to what's going on in that meeting, but maybe those ladies there would like to. And for once in your life, why don't you think of somebody else? Huh? It was true. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been on the street since I was 13 years old. I I couldn't say a full sentence without four-letter words in it. That's how I talked. I didn't know any other way to talk. Frank so eloquently talked about it last night. Huh? And nobody centered me out in a meeting. Nobody embarrassed me in a meeting or put me down. But you took me aside after the meeting with love. And you said to me, kid, this isn't some juke joint bar room you're sitting in now. 
This is Alcoholics Anonymous. This is an organization of ladies and gentlemen. And we don't talk that way in AA. Maybe that language doesn't bother you, but maybe it bothers that gentleman sitting there. And for once in your life, why don't you think of somebody else? Huh? Who is true. And the change has started in my life. And you took me through this thing. And I'm not going to talk about our program this morning. Time's not going to permit. But I want to just quickly share that, you know, I'm so grateful. You know, we talk and we read and how it works at almost every meeting we go to, don't we? And at the end of it, it says we practice these principles in all our affairs. At the end of when we read those steps, it says, oh, what an order. Uh, I can't go through with it. Don't you love what they say after that? Huh? Don't be discouraged. None of us can. None of us can. It says, as a matter of fact, none of us is able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. Huh? The point is we're willing to grow along spiritual lines. I practice this thing. Again, to go, but Frank did it so good. I just, I, just, I just show up. Suit up and show up and do what I'm told. But you told me there's one thing that I have to do, and the only thing I have to do 100% here is that first step. That I have to admit to my innermost self that we're alcoholic and our lives would be kind of unmanageable. Not here. I could go to any meeting anywhere in the world I want today and say to those people in there, are you powerless over alcohol your life? My, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We all know it here. But do I know it here? In my innermost self. In the depth of my soul. And I'll tell you why I have to do that 100%. Because if I don't believe in the depth of my soul that taking these actions and doing these things that my life depends on it, I'll stop taking the action. Because I'm selfish and self-centered. And soon as my life starts getting better, I'll stop. And I'll get comfortable. I have to believe that my life depends upon it. And you took me through and you took me through an inventory to help me to see because I couldn't see. I never knew. I didn't do an inventory and go, my, 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 but you haven't been a very nice boy. (laughs) Huh? That wasn't, I knew I was a lying thief. Uh, That wasn't news to me. But I'll tell you something. When you're a people pleaser, you have absolutely no idea how full of resentment and hate you really are. Huh? Because you push everything down. And you push everything down. When you're out there in the streets trying to be a tough guy, you don't know your life is run on fear. I had no idea those things. I had no idea about these defects of character that I had. You helped me to see this in that inventory. And that's why I had to share it with somebody who understood what I was trying to do. Because I can't differentiate the truth from the false. Huh? I need your help. I need your guidance. I, Frank mentioned again last I talked to my sponsor every day for 15 years. I talked to my sponsor last night. Huh? That's just, that's just what I do. And you took me through this stuff and, 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 and you talked to me about change. And you showed me in that six and seven that says this is a step that separates the men from the boys. And that's not meant in any sexist way, but I knew it was important. Huh? I knew it was important. I had to get rid of all those ideas and all those old ways and start to allow the new ones to come into my life. And I made, had to make restitution. I believe that our program and our steps are a character building process. I believe that through a series of actions we start to change. I believe it's a process. I believe recovery is a process the same way I believe that relapse is a process. Huh? You ever hear that? Oh, Harry just had a slip. Oh, really? Huh? You show me an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous who has a sponsor, who's sponsoring people, who's applying these 12 steps to his life, who has a home group, taking actions in his life, just popped in for a rum and coke? Huh? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I don't buy that. We slip long before we slip. Huh? We slip long before we take the drink. Long before. And you showed me where I had to continue to take inventory. I think someone else said it this weekend. Very important step uh, in my life the more time goes on. Because I want to tell you, sometimes the longer that I am in Alcoholics Anonymous, sometimes the longer I am with you, the harder it is for me to be truthful with you. Sometimes the longer it is that I am here, the harder it is for me to come to you and tell you I'm dying inside and I don't know what to do. Because I want you to think I have it all together. Sometimes the longer I am in Alcoholics Anonymous, the easier it is for me to become critical and judgmental. Look what they're doing over at that group. Look what that guy and gal. Look what they're doing. Huh? I know you'd never do that. But I can. Huh? I've listened to people debate for 45 minutes of whether they were recovered or recovering. Huh? (laughs) Jesus. 
Semantics, huh? Semantics. I'll tell you what you showed me in the book. You showed me in the book where you said it is easy to let up in the spiritual program of action and to rest on our laurels. And if we do, we're headed for trouble because we are not cured of alcoholism. What I have is a daily reprieve that's contingent upon the maintenance of my spiritual condition, not on my spiritual condition, because some days I think my spiritual condition is a lot better than it really is. <laughs> my spiritual condition is maintained here with you and Alcoholics Anonymous doing the things that I need to do on a daily basis. I cannot stay sober because I used to be a GSR. I cannot stay sober because I used to go to the detox. I cannot stay sober because I used to make coffee at my home group. Alcoholics Anonymous is what about I'm doing today. And it's important for me to look. And you told me that I had to, to grow spiritually, improve that conscious contact. Uh, we hear it talked about in Alcoholics Anonymous that our problem being that conscious separation. Huh? That conscious separation. Never understood what that was. Never understood. See, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I never disbelieved. I wasn't a disbeliever. I believed that there was a God. But let me tell you what I believed. I believed that there was a God and he was way up there. And he watched over. And if you were good, he did good things for you. If you were bad, he did bad things for you. Huh? And God was way up there. Well, if God is way up there and I'm down here, is there any more of a conscious separation than that? See, I didn't understand that deep down in every side of man, woman and child is a fundamental idea. That the great reality for us is our Creator has entered our hearts in a way that is indeed miraculous. That power is right in here. That power is real. It's not something mystical, magical. It is a power that is real in my life and it works in all areas of my life. And I try to improve that conscious contact with it through prayer and meditation, through being with you, through doing these things that I need to do. And the great paradox of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I want to keep it, I've got to give it away. Huh? Are we not blessed people? If we take a look at the things that have happened in our lives, we come here and do these things, the lives that you and I enjoy. And I know if you're not new, that sounds, or if you are new, that sounds crazy to you now, but keep coming. Look, look. Huh? You see, I'll tell you how I came to believe. I came to believe by watching you. That's how I came to believe. Huh? And, and, and everything we've been given, if that isn't enough, after everything that has happened in our lives, then you and I are given the ability to maybe make a small difference in someone else's life. What an incredible deal. Huh? It says in our book that alcoholics laugh at sometimes seemingly tragic situations. <laughs> have you ever wondered... Sometimes you have a birthday, you have, you, what you call it here, get your cake, whatever you say, and, and visitors will come, our families, people never been to AA before. Have you ever wondered what those people at times think of us? <laughs> huh? Some monkey like me gets up here and says things like, yes, I bought a brand new Cadillac, picked it up at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, and I totaled it at 10. <laughs> we all laugh. Huh? Frank is choking some guy on his desk and we all laugh. Huh? His partner's shooting him in the head. We all laugh. Have you ever wondered what some of those people leave thinking? It says that we laugh at sometimes seemingly, seemingly tragic situations. You know what it says after that? Of course you do. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Because we have recovered and been given the power to help others. Huh? That you and I, properly armed with facts about ourselves, not facts. I've known lots of alcoholics died drunk, knowing lots of facts. Facts about ourselves are able to help in a few short hours when nobody else was able to. What a beautiful deal. My life before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous had absolutely no meaning and no purpose whatsoever. I don't know about yours. None. I was either drunk, planning on getting drunk, recovering from being drunk. I was in trouble, trying to get out of trouble, planning on more trouble. Huh? My entire life focused around drinking and I worked all week so I could get drunk all weekend. Huh? And everybody in my life was the same. Alkies don't hang out with social drinkers. Huh? My entire life focused around that. No meaning. No. I'd hear people say things like, would you like to go for a walk? 
I'd say a what? <laughs> Where? <laughs> you want to walk to the liquor store? You want to go score or walk where? Oh, well, Butch, the leaves are changing color. I just thought we'd go for a walk. What? You go for a walk. Tim and I going for a couple of scoots. A walk. No meaning, no purpose. At Detox, I talk about I also go there on Sundays because uh, we have a nice speaker uh, meeting Sunday morning. It's going to start in half an hour at home, about 250 people. And I like to take the new people to that speaker meeting. I like taking new people to speaker meetings. I know that's not very fashionable today. Everybody wants to share. I just kind of think it's good to take them. Because I remember being new. I remember being new in those speaker meetings. I'd sit in that meeting. I wouldn't hear one single word said in the first 50 minutes. I was so busy thinking of the brilliant things I was going to say when it was my turn. And I wouldn't hear another word said after that because I was busy thinking about the things I forgot to say when it was my turn. I just think it's good to take them to listen. Anyway, I go there one day. There's a guy in bad shape, real bad, looked bad, felt bad, smelt bad, physically bad shape. I thought, this guy might die. I figure he can die at the meeting as easy as he can die here, so I took him with me. I took him to that meeting, nice speaker meeting. After the meeting, we spent a couple hours talking about this deal, this design for living, this way of life. And I left him. I didn't see him again. I'm sitting in the meeting one day. I see a guy come walking across the room. I can see he's coming over to me. Clean cut looking guy. Had a pair of slacks on, shirt, clean cut. Comes walking up. He said, Butch, he said, you probably don't remember me. I said, I'm sorry, I don't, but I meet a lot of people. He says, my name's Ziggy. I went, holy smokes. That's not really what I said, but that's what I'm saying this morning. He says, you remember me? I said, oh, I remember you. It's the guy. And he's looking good. He said, Butch, I just wanted to come and thank you for taking me to that meeting. I haven't had a drink since that day, and it's almost been a year. I said, congratulations. He said, I was wondering if I can ask a favor of you. I said, if I can do it. He said, will you come and talk at my one-year AA birthday? I said, I'd be honored to. I went to talk at a deal a few years ago, and I got up in front of a room full of people, and I couldn't get rolling. I started to cry, and I'll tell you why. I looked out, and there sitting at the front table in a suit and tie, looking like a million bucks, with his wife and all his children, was Ziggy. And he was getting his 10-year medallion. Took him to his first meeting, talked at his one, talked at his five, talked at his ten. You think my life doesn't have meaning? You think my life doesn't have purpose? Huh? I could stand up here for the next two hours. I'd be all alone. Telling you things that have happened in my life. Huh? Everything in my life is because of you. Huh? Do I get three more minutes, Al? I'm taking them anyway, just so I'd be nice to ask. <laughs> I want to just quickly wrap this thing up with just a couple of things if I could. I want to just touch on something we talk about at many meetings that I go to. I don't know about you, discussion meetings. I think the most talked about topic. In all of Alcoholics Anonymous, if we could somehow take a survey and find out what we talk about most of all, I think it'd be hands down, huh? Uh, what's the topic tonight? Oh, let's discuss gratitude. Huh? My sponsor told me gratitude is an action, not a thought. Don't tell me how grateful you are, Butch. Show me. Show me you're grateful. And I want to tell you this morning that I'm just grateful to be grateful. Because before coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was never grateful a single solitary day in my life. No matter what I had, it was never enough. If I had a car, I wanted a newer car, a house, a bigger house, a job, a different job. It didn't matter what I had in my life. I always wanted more or different. Didn't know the meaning of gratitude. Huh? I had the good fortune to go to our international convention in Minneapolis in 2000. Quick little sidebar to that. You know where it says in our book, our past will be our greatest asset? Huh? U.S. immigration has not read that chapter. <laughs> I'm going to Minneapolis to our international convention with my sponsor. I am so excited. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I wasn't able to go in Seattle and San Diego for reasons, but I'm going there, and I'm going with my sponsor, who I love as much as life itself. And I am, I like, oh, I'm telling you, I can't even sleep all night. And I go and I pick my sponsor up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We drive to Pearson International Airport. To make a long story short, he got on the airplane. I didn't. 
I'm here tonight to tell her this morning to tell you our past will be our greatest asset. I got to Minneapolis, just took a couple days. All in the name of God. Anyway, when you get there, as many of you know, they ask the people when they register anybody sober over 40 years to let themselves be known. And on the Saturday night at the big meeting, they have all the members sit together and they draw 15 names out of a hat and they each speak for a few minutes. A beautiful deal for many of you have been there. And if you haven't, it's, it's a beautiful thing. At that time, my sponsor was sober over 40 years. And by then, Bob's health was starting to decline. He had emphysema and his breathing wasn't so good and he couldn't walk that well. And on Saturday night, they said to me, kid, you take your sponsor down there and you sit with him because they have all the old timers sit together at the foot of the stage. And on Saturday night, I sat in Minneapolis with 60,000 members of Alcoholics Anonymous, 202 members sober over 40 years. And I turned and I looked at that little man who'd given his entire life to this program, and I watched the tears rolling down his face. And I felt a sense of gratitude beyond anything I've ever known. You see, my friends, every single thing in my life that is good, anything that I am, is because of you. It's because of you. If I lived to be a thousand years old, I could never pay you back. And you want to know the kicker to this thing? You've never asked me to. You have never asked me for a single solitary thing since the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You have merely suggested to me, although at times strongly, (laughs) that I give a little bit back of what's so freely been given to me. Take a new guy to a couple of meetings, you said. Show him some love and kindness. Maybe give him a hug and tell him he's going to be okay. I don't know how you feel about that, but it seems like a terribly small price for what's been given to me. I only hope and pray that in some way my actions can reflect my gratitude to what you've given me. I had some people say to me, but you talk an awful lot about gratitude at those meetings. Couldn't help but notice you had a new car out in the parking lot. Business going pretty good. Pretty easy to be grateful when things are going well in our life, isn't it? But how grateful are we when they aren't? How grateful are we then? Well, that sponsor that I told you about, that little man I loved as much as life itself, and he and I traveled all over Canada and in this country together for many, many years. My sponsor was sober 46 years. And he had to go talk at a, at a meeting at a young gal's one-year birthday, a couple hours from our home. And I called him. He'd been in the hospital twice, his breathing. He was on oxygen all the time and that now and in a wheelchair. And I phoned him. I said, Bobby, I said, I think I'd better call Cliff and Mary and let them know we can't come tonight. They'll understand. You haven't been good. He said, oh, no, kid. He said, that young gal's expecting us. We've got to go. And I went and I picked him up and I've got oxygen tanks, wheelchairs, hoses. I got more stuff in my truck than the paramedics got. <laughs> We make a two-hour drive down the highway, and we get there. There's no wheelchair access, so they put him, the boys put him right in the wheelchair and carry him down the stairs in his wheelchair. We got tanks going in. I got hoses hooked in the wall. I got them hooked all up. Huh? And he gave a talk like you wouldn't believe. He gave it all. And at the end, he was done. He was done. And we got him all unhooked and all the gear, and the boys helped me. We got in the truck and stuff, and he and I headed home. And we're driving up the road. He said to me, kid, he said, I'm awfully glad you were with me tonight. I said, well, so am I, Bob. But we were always together. We couldn't go somewhere without the other without half the room wanting to know where the other was. And, and, and I said, well, I'm glad I was with you, too. He said, no, kid, I'm real glad you're with me tonight. He said, I think I just gave my last talk. Now, you have to understand that my, my sponsor spoke at somewhere between 100 and 150 AA meetings a year for 45 years. I said, oh, Bobby, you're just tired. You'll feel better tomorrow. That was June the 8th. On June the 9th, I phoned him, and he was feeling a little bit better, and we talked him that a bit. And before I'd left him that night, he said to me, you got a few minutes, kid? I said, i got all the time in the world. And he looked through his journal. He said, it's okay, kid. The journal's empty. That's the first time that journal had been empty in 45 years. And on June the 10th, AA's birthday, around supper time, I phoned him, and I didn't get an answer. And I called back about 20 minutes later, and I didn't get an answer again. And I knew. I knew. And you know when you know and you don't want to know? huh? And it took me two hours because I didn't want to go there because I, I knew. And I, and I drove around, and a couple, I went and got a young guy sponsored. I said, come on, we've got to go to the old guy's place. And I was crying. He says to me, what's wrong, Butch? I said, the old guy's gone. He said, how do you know? I said, because it's June the 10th. And the book's empty. And we went to the condo and I got let in. 
And there was that little man kneeling beside his bed, face down, and he was gone home. And it was like somebody unzipped me. You know, Al, you just lost a a guy. It's like somebody unzipped me and took my heart out. I felt an emptiness and a loneliness like I hadn't felt in a long time. And we're there a long time, and the paramedics come, and the police come, and all that stuff. And that wrapped up, and I went home. It's late now. And my Deb, she was away flying. She was in England, and I was there by myself. And I sat in my living room, and I had a long cry. Please don't misunderstand me. My life is good. My life is rich and full and exciting. And it will continue to be so as long as I stay here with you doing the things that I need to do. But you see, I knew that night there was a part of my life that had just changed. And it was never going to be the same again. And I missed them. And I had a long cry and I went upstairs to my bed. And I knelt down beside my bed. And I thank God for another day of sobriety. You see, my friends, Alcoholics Anonymous works in the good times and Alcoholics Anonymous works in the tough times. Alcoholics Anonymous works all the time. In those darkest hours, in those days when we feel like our heart's going to break in two, when going home and reading 449 isn't going to quite cut it for you. That's when the men and women in Alcoholics Anonymous, the men and women in your group, the sponsor, the people you sponsor, they will pick you up. And carry you through. Alcoholics Anonymous works all the time. That sounds like a sad story, but it's not a sad story. See, I had 15 years with one of the giants of Alcoholics Anonymous. People, you say to me, oh, Butch, how terrible you had to find them. I thought, oh, you don't understand. You see, that was just one more time God taking care. I couldn't imagine somebody phoning me, telling me he was gone. Huh? And I have a sponsor today that I'm close with and love, and, 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 and that's just the deal. I want to thank Al and this committee for the opportunity and privilege of being here with you this weekend. I really have had a wonderful time, your hospitality. I want to thank you people for your kindness and patience in listening to me here this morning. You know, I don't know what's going to happen from here on in, and none of us know for sure, do we? See, that's called life. Just because we get sober and become members of Alcoholics Anonymous, life doesn't stop happening. People die. Relationships end. People get sick. Businesses fail. Life still goes on. But I'll tell you something. Every single morning for some time now, I say to my friend upstairs, if you see fit, I sure would appreciate it if you keep me in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my dear friends, there's no place in this whole world I'd rather be than right here with you fine, fine people. Thank you and God bless you.